I understand your point of view and have taken it into consideration. Now, allow me to share my decision. My wedding with Terry will happen very soon, and we would be delighted to have you attend the ceremony and banquet. Best regards. Brian left the room, ignoring his mother's moans. Brian! But he closed the door behind him firmly, yet carefully without slamming it, and that was that. Stephanie still clutched her heart, while her husband mindlessly clicked buttons on the remote control. Bernard, please turn that off, I beg you. Can't you talk to him? This is horrible. I agree it's horrible, but it appears to be happening. I've talked and his response was the same. And now what? He's going to marry that country girl. Brian's mother couldn't accept her son's choice. Perhaps, but what can we do? What do you mean? Are you suggesting we just accept it and call that girl our daughter? Bernard was also against the idea of his only son marrying a girl from nowhere, without any family or status, who was raised by the grandmother in a village. Brian, on the other hand, had a brilliant education and upbringing. His parents had put in so much effort, blood, sweat and tears into him, not to mention money. And he wasn't just a rich kid anymore, but he had his own business. He could have easily found a girl from his own circle, which would have added to their wealth and status. But no, he found that damn Terry. Looking at his weeping wife, Bernard suddenly felt annoyance. Stephanie, enough. Don't worry so much. Of course, I'll talk to him again. But even if it happens, what's the tragedy? Divorces constantly happen. Bernard, what are you saying? Do you think that it's that simple? Just get divorced and that's it? Children are born in such marriages, and even more readily than in equal ones. And also, reputation matters. What century do we live in? Bernard recited with rolling eyes. And where and in what circles do divorces or children from affairs considered so reprehensible? It's laughable now that someone has only been married once. Stop this hysteria, please. Okay, reputation means nothing to you. But what about our son's emotional state? How will he handle a failed marriage or divorce? Stephanie wrung her hands. You fool, her husband barked, unable to bear this scene. Stop putting on a show in front of me. Emotional stress? What else will come up with it? A sin before the Lord? A minus to karma? He could lose money because of Terry. That's what you're afraid of. And so am I. That's what we should focus on, not metaphysics. I'll talk to him like a sensible person when he calls down, thoughtfully and with examples from life. Yes, Bernard knew what he was talking about. He had made mistakes in his youth and even in his more mature years, and some had cost him dearly. He would explain to his son what indiscriminate relationships could lead to. At first glance, Terry was an angel from heaven, but it was time to realize that such lambs were often the most dangerous. That's what he needed to warn his son about. Meanwhile, Brian secluded himself in his room, really trying to cool off after the conversation with his parents. Yet he knew they were somewhat snobbish and understood that they might not accept his girlfriend with enthusiasm, but not to that extent. He couldn't help bringing his beloved home and introducing her to his parents. Oh, if he only knew what trouble it would cause, he wouldn't have done it. Later after the wedding, he would have just told them, I got married and this is my lawful wife. Please love and welcome her. Or maybe he wouldn't have introduced them at all. Some people do that. After all, he's an adult, independent person. He has his own stable income. Who could have thought that Terry wouldn't please them? And most importantly, why? Yes, she was an orphan and grew up with her grandmother in the village, but that was rather a plus. She came to the city without any connections or protections, received a good education, and looked great. Her taste, manners, and sense of style were impeccable. And she was honest, didn't make anything up or pretend to be a princess. Yes, she had no money. So what? Today she had money, and tomorrow she would have more than they had. Or were they unhappy that he had just decided to get married? 
Well, at 26, it was time. Oh, he shouldn't have done it the way they wanted. Introduction and all of that. They embarrassed themselves, and they embarrassed him, and they hurt Terry. Although they deserved credit for trying to welcome her, they set the table for the guest, behaved nicely, and didn't show their boorish attitude. But Terry was so smart, she understood everything. She felt even her mother's slightest disapproval, and sometimes almost open mockery from her father. Yesterday, when Brian came home after that formal dinner, she said with a tired smirk, They don't like me. Brian even stopped the car to persuade her that she wasn't marrying his parents, but him. He needed her by his side because he loved her with his heart and soul. But still, parents' opinions mean something. What if you quarrel with them because of me, and in a few years you'll realize that you hurt your mum and dad, and it will turn against me? A man can have as many wives as he likes, but parents are the only ones. Terry, please don't worry. Firstly, I assure you, I'm not going to quarrel with anyone. And secondly, tell me, why do you think they have something against you? Yes, it's the first meeting, and there are understandable prejudices. They don't know yet what to expect from you. I don't even know what they're afraid of. And just in case, they're waiting for something bad, aren't they? Oh, come on. Terry, you're wonderful, and I'll always be on your side, no matter what. And it's also indisputable that I'll only have one wife. Yes, if they make everything right, no one will ever separate them. If he had to break up with his parents to be with her, well, Brian was ready for that. After all, father and mother will always remain his. There won't be any others, just as there won't be another son for them. At that moment, his father came into his room, knocking. So, Rebel, have you calmed down? He asked in an adjusting tone. I wasn't nervous. Everything's fine, Dad. You and Mum seem to be worried for no reason. Everything seems all right, Brian said. Why be rude, then? Your mother is upset. She's crying, by the way. And she has hypertension, among other things, his father said. What is there to cry about? What's the tragedy? Did I decide to get involved with a bandit? To elope with a gypsy? To get together with a married mother of 20 years older than me? What's the big deal? At first glance, nothing is wrong. Your Terry is a charming girl. I even envy you. She looks wonderful. But what's she like on the inside? What is her character? You can't know that, because... You've only known her for a few months. But you saw from the first glance that she's a miracle, the son exclaimed. Yes, I did, but how old is she? Twenty-three years old? And how has she lived here since she came from her wilderness? How did she become so graceful and confident? By herself? Or maybe some man, or even many men, helped her? Asked her father. Look, father, I'm not going to listen to insults about my bride. If there's something you don't like, yes, I know. You'll leave home with her and we won't see you anymore. Bernard continued for him. It's your right. Just think for yourself. Is this for long? You see, I've suffered a lot in my life because of women. Their greed, their desire not so much to arrange their own lives as to destroy men's lives. That's not about Terry, Brian replied sharply. Are you certain? I still advise you to be more careful. Try to check her out, the father advised. You're not planning to just take a walk with her under the moon. You're planning to tie your life to hers. I believe her, Dad, and she believes me too. We know everything about each other that we need to know. Brian was fully convinced of what he was saying. But the father had a different opinion. Are you sure? What if she already knows much more than you think? about the state of your bank accounts, about your company, about everything, including childhood illnesses, about the girl you first kissed in fifth grade. Brian laughed. Dad, forgive me, but this is some kind of paranoia already. But look, still take my words into consideration. I've lived my life and seen it all, and I wish you only good. I'll be the first to be happy if everything is well between you and Terry. And look at your friends. Have there been any cases 
of varying severity. Bernard spoke without pressure. He was just tired and sad, and it had the greatest impact on his son. The father had already left, but Brian sat there digesting the conversation. Yes, he fully trusted Terry. She never lied or hid anything from him, and he had not a single reason to doubt his beloved. But he also trusted his father, and his father clearly only wished good for him. And yes, Bernard really had a lot of experience. Brian didn't want to delve too deeply into his father's secrets, but his words about the cases that happened to Brian's friends struck a chord. There were stories in his friends' lives that cost them many nerves and, frankly, money. And since his friends were mostly children of well-to-do parents, it was no surprise that many of them had suffered in one way or another because of the perfidy of women. Brian remembered the pale, overgrown and swollen face of Harry, who had recently gone on a multi-day binge after such a love crash. I loved her, Brian, do you believe it or not? Truly forever, do you understand? I gave her my soul, wrote poetry I'd never written before, and that night I came up with a dozen of sonnets. But it turns out she didn't need a soul or sonnets. She needed money, and why? To support her beloved. He's in jail, it turns out, for attacking her. And now he needed money for the lawyer to get out earlier. And I composed poems and sang songs to her like a fool. Harry drunkenly cried. Brian had seen a photo of that girl. She was gorgeous. Her eyes were honest. And in fact, she was involved in such an ugly story. Or, for example, another friend, Bill. They often saw him in the company of such beauty that it's impossible to describe. Not only was she beautiful, but also intelligent and educated. It was clear from miles away that she was of noble blood. She even played the piano. And it turned out that in the past, she was an escort. Then she rose to the rank of elite mistress and stripped several wealthy bums to the bone. And Bill was among them. Stop! What am I doing? Who am I comparing Terry to? I'm out of my mind. And who am I listening to? My father, who has come up with all sorts of things just to dissuade me from getting married. Whose examples am I following? My friends who couldn't distinguish princesses from monsters? But Terry is completely different from them. She's made of different stuff. Although maybe everyone else thinks the same way. No, Terry is simply not capable of anything like that. I'm not going to test her. I never even thought of doing something like that. But now I just want to prove to everyone how honest and selfless she is. It won't be a test. It will be proof. Maybe when my parents find out the truth, their attitude towards Terry will change. And Brian decided to prove it in a harmless way. During their next meeting, less than a week away from their wedding day, Terry mentioned that she had to travel a lot for work and conduct inspections at various sites. She was provided a car with a driver for this purpose, but she still had to order a cab frequently. The car broke down, or the driver felt ill. So, Terry, you have a driver's license? I do have a driver's license. My uncle was a driving instructor, and he taught me how to drive. I passed my test on the first try. But I haven't bought a car as yet. Terry smiled. This wasn't a hint at all. Terry never asked him for anything and refused to accept overly expensive gifts. At the beginning of their relationship, he tried to give her a gold bracelet, which only offended the girl, and he had to apologize. I'm not your relative or mistress. I can accept flowers or an invitation to a cafe, but not jewelry. Well, now that you have your license, let me let you drive my new car for a while. You'll be much more comfortable that way. Do you trust me? Aren't you afraid I'll scratch it? I'm not the least bit afraid of that, Brian replied. I'm much more afraid that we won't be able to meet because you're too tired, and that the next taxi driver might be a maniac killer. He will take you somewhere unknown. Terry agreed, and the next day she went on her errands in Brian's car. Unaware that he had installed a hidden video camera, 
he could see the footage on his smartphone. Brian tried to justify it to himself by saying he was caring for and worrying about his bride. And the fact that he was worried from the very beginning that the camera might show something he wouldn't like, he carefully hid from himself. Nothing unusual happened on the first day. Terry ran errands, didn't take passengers, and only spoke on the phone about work and with Brian. In other words, there were no surprises. The young man began to feel ashamed of what he had done and was ready to remove the camera and apologize or say nothing at all. But he decided to wait several more days and the next day he saw something he didn't like at all. This time, the ride was clearly not work-related. Terry pulled up to a house, stopped, got out of the car and waited. Soon a man appeared who could not be imagined as anyone's lover. An old, poorly dressed man appeared, but his appearance made Terry happy. She approached and hugged the man. They stood there looking at each other tenderly. Someone who didn't know Terry might have thought it was her father, but Brian knew that she didn't have a father. And this man, who had clearly been beaten down by life, couldn't be a relative. So why was Terry so happy to see him? And why were they hugging? The couple got into a car and drove off. Brian quickly abandoned everything and drove after them. He hoped he would see something that would calm him down. Luckily, Terry stopped not too far away in a deserted place. Brian decided not to distract himself by watching the camera and instead saw with his own eyes what was happening inside his car. He approached and quickly opened the door. His beloved was sitting next to the man. They were just talking and holding hands. Tears glistened in Terry's eyes. Her groom's unexpected appearance confused her. She couldn't find the words to say at first. The man also sat silently, looking surprised at Brian. Oh, Brian, she finally said. Meet my father. Paul, Dad, this is my fiancé. His name is Brian, and I'm marrying him. Pleased to meet you. When did they adopt her? Wasn't it just a few days ago that she didn't have a father? Brian said indignantly, but Terry had already regained her composure and took control of the situation. Please sit down, Brian. I see you decided to follow me. I wonder what you wanted to see. Wait, daughter, it's all clear. He's jealous because he loves you. Calm down, young man. Yes, I'm not her natural father, but I adopted her right after she was born. And for the last few years, I've been in prison. And it's understandable that Terry was ashamed to admit it, so she hid the fact that she had such a relative. And then, as luck would have it, I was released a little earlier. That's how it turned out. Here are the documents about my release. Take a look if you don't believe me. And my daughter Terry, although she's embarrassed by me, isn't going to completely abandon me. Isn't that right, daughter? Yes, Dad. I'll never abandon you. Brian, judge me now as you wish. My mother really did die, and my father is here now, and he won't get in our way, but I won't be able to let him go from my life now. I'll help him as much as I can. Thank you, Terry. I expected nothing less from you, her father said. Well, okay, I agree, Brian said, ashamed. Sorry, Terry, I thought... I didn't know what came over me, and I don't understand why you hid this from me. How could it affect my attitude towards you? I love you, so I have to accept your relatives too. I invite you to our wedding. It's in two days, and I understand that you may have some problems, but I'll give you money for the salon, hairdresser and suit. Oh, and if you don't have time to buy one, you can take one of mine. Our figures are almost the same. Thank you, Brian, Terry said. You don't have to worry about money. I'll be able to help my father myself. And yes... I'll be delighted to see you at my wedding, Dad. Great, you don't have to worry. I won't ruin your wedding. I won't even go to the registry office. You'll get married without me, but I'll stop by the restaurant. I'll congratulate you and sit quietly in a corner somewhere, but I'm afraid that I'll be irritating your parents no matter what suit I wear. Now it was Brian's turn to be embarrassed. Well, no, my parents won't mind. They'll be happy to meet you. He muttered, 
realizing he was lying. Terry understood this too. Deep down, Terry would have been happy to have a wedding without any parents. She was not afraid that her father would do or say something wrong, and was sure that nothing like that would happen. But her in-laws might openly ruin their wedding, and it was entirely possible that they would not get by without sarcastic remarks. And even if they just sat there with a dissatisfied look, it would seriously spoil her mood. However, Terry understood that it was impossible to have a wedding without parents. And Brian would not agree to it either. Many people around her would not understand. She was willing to endure it. There's nothing wrong with not being loved by your loved one's own parents. But she believed her father would behave decently. On the day of the wedding, the solemn ceremony went quite successfully. Bernard and Stephanie perhaps did not shine with joy, but they did not show any particular sadness about their son's wedding. Brian talked to them, explained what a wonderful girl Terry was. He believed in her completely, and thought that his father and mother would soon love her too. Therefore, there was no need to spoil their relationship. Understand, we're not going to live together only three days or three years. We'll be together for our whole lives, and that means together with you. So let's live peacefully and amicably. Well, what choice do we have? sighed Stephanie. Of course, we won't spoil your holiday. All right, son, what are you worrying about? His father reassured him. Everything will be fine. We have nothing against your bride. After the solemn registration, everyone moved to the restaurant. Terry looked worried. She hadn't seen her father yet, and she still had to introduce him to her new relatives. The banquet hall was not big, but was not small either, and Terry understood perfectly that her father would like to sit not with anyone, but separately, and there was a table for that purpose. Not far from the newlyweds, but without any unnecessary company. She doubted that he would immediately get along with her in-laws. But finally he appeared. He was delighted with his daughter, who looked extraordinary in her wedding dress, looked around the hall, took his place, and was about to sit down at the table, but then his gaze fell on the groom's parents, and Paul froze in amazement. The thing was that he knew these people perfectly well, and knew them not from the best side. It was thanks to Brian's father that he ended up in prison at one time, and he was completely innocent. Paul was naturally not going to start a fight at his daughter's wedding, and so he quickly pulled himself together, pushed his chair back, sat down at the table, and realized that he could not pretend to be completely happy. Heavy memories came flooding back, poisoning the initially joyful mood. Almost 30 years ago, he had just gotten married and worked as a driver for a wealthy company. Paul was more than satisfied with his job. He was paid a decent salary, and the owners treated the service staff perfectly well. Everything was fine until one day the owner was found dead in the car, and he found him, Paul. He became the main suspect and then the accused, and this, although there was no evidence against him. At first there was no evidence, but during the investigation, the unfortunate widow began to give the strangest testimonies, which were against Paul. She burst into tears, claiming that the driver had repeatedly made indecent proposals to her, and that she eventually complained to her husband, which caused a serious conflict between the driver and the owner. Her words were confirmed by another family member who, according to him, witnessed this conflict and the fact that the driver threatened him. Paul had no evidence of his innocence and as a result, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Only his young wife believed in him and never gave up on him. She supported him wrote encouraging letters and visited him. Thanks to this, their daughter Terry was born. However, she couldn't fight for his acquittal and release, as she lacked knowledge, experience and most importantly money. During one of their visits, she revealed that the widow of the murdered man had married the family friend, who corroborated her testimony. If they had had a competent lawyer, 
they could have proven Paul's innocence. But where could they find one? Then, when their daughter hadn't even started school yet, Paul's wife died. Terry was spared being sent to an orphanage thanks to her grandmother, who raised her alone all these years. When Paul was released from prison, he found his daughter as a teenager and wanted to start an honest life. But where could he find a job? It was very difficult for a person who had been imprisoned for such a crime, and he wanted to help his daughter. As a result of his desperation, he agreed to steal from the store and soon went to prison again, this time for five years. And now he was out. He found his daughter with difficulty and was so happy to see that she was doing well and getting married. And now it turned out that Terry was marrying the man from the family that ruined her father's life. Meanwhile, the groom's father had also recognized his old enemy, and he didn't even think of feeling guilty of the role he played in the man's life. On the contrary, he decided to eliminate him from his family's life, so that certain secrets never surfaced. Perhaps this would also help get rid of the unwanted bride. Thinking about this, he grinned hungrily and approached the microphone. Dear guests, I want to inform you that today we have a double celebration. Well, firstly, my son's wedding, and secondly, the release from prison of the bride's father. Let's applaud the man who was twice convicted and spent almost 20 years in prison, including for murder, and didn't break. He feels great, and even showed up at his daughter's wedding without spending a penny. This was completely unexpected for everyone. Some guests hesitantly applauded while others sat there not knowing how to react to such a display. Paul was not just stunned, he was almost killed by this horrible speech of the man, because of whom he went to prison. And now this man, who was likely the perpetrator of the murder, was openly shaming him in front of everyone. But he didn't want to say it out loud, so as not to ruin his daughter's celebration. He didn't even try to approach the microphone. He stood up, bowed to his guests, approached his daughter, and kissed her on the cheek. I'm sorry, daughter. I didn't know whose son you were marrying. Moreover, you didn't even know. Then he turned to Brian, saying, And do you even know that you're not the biological son of these two? They adopted you as a baby for your father's inheritance, whom they killed together, and then framed me. So you should keep that in mind. Anyway, be happy. You're not responsible for the sins of your parents, either biological or adoptive, Terry's father said, and then he left. The groom and bride stood there in complete confusion, looking at each other. Brian was the first to recover. Terry, let's not try to figure anything out right now. Let this day be the happiest day of our lives, and we'll deal with the rest later. I really didn't know anything just like you. After that, the wedding naturally went according to a slightly different scenario. Bernard tried to approach his son and start a conversation with him. Stephanie, on the other hand, cited ill health and left. The bride burst into tears. The celebration was somewhat complete. The newlyweds didn't go to the groom's parents' luxurious house, but rather to a hotel, where they decided to spend their wedding night and calm down after everything that had happened. However, they didn't even understand what had happened. Meanwhile, Brian's parents were having a heated argument. Idiot! Stephanie shouted. Why didn't you listen to me just once in your life? My heart told me that all of this was not good. This whole wedding. This Terry. Where did she come from? How much I wanted to prevent this. But you spoke like a fool. Divorce is not a problem. Reputation is nothing. Let them get married. And now we could end up in jail. Jail? Are you crazy? All the deadlines have long passed. This lousy con can't prove anything anymore. And if he starts blabbing, he'll end up where he came from. I don't care if he ends up anywhere. For a quarter of a century, everything was going smoothly. Everything was perfect. And now, all of a sudden, he'll prove it. He won't. Nothing will happen. Is Brian a fool to believe the chatter of some ex-convict? Who knows what he blabbered? 
and if he believed it, what of it? Stephanie took some pills and went to bed but couldn't calm down. All the complex twists and turns of her tangled life were passing before her eyes, and how well everything was going at first. In her early youth, she managed to marry a very promising young man, a prominent businessman. She became a rich woman, living the life that many could only dream of. But then, her husband took a mistress. And not just that, but he fell in love with her, and he decided to divorce Stephanie. She tried everything to avoid it. She threatened to kill herself, to do all sorts of horrors with her husband and his mistress. But no, he was firm in his decision. Apparently, love actually happened. Moreover, this scoundrel decided to have a child with her. That was what Stephanie could not do. And this threatened to mean losing all the wealth, and Stephanie could not accept that. Her husband postponed the final divorce and marriage with a pregnant mistress because she had some problems with pregnancy. She was constantly lying in hospitals. That fact was encouraging for Stephanie. Maybe there would be no child at all, as well as no mistress. But not only did the child appear, but the husband also immediately adopted him and rewrote the will, leaving everything to the newborn baby, and hence his mother. Action had to be taken immediately, before the divorce was concluded. Fortunately, the husband had a partner, an old friend of his, this very Bernard. Stephanie conspired with him. They managed to eliminate her husband, diverting all suspicion away from themselves and framing another person, a driver. Everything worked out perfectly with the mistress too, she, still not recovering after giving birth, was lying in the hospital all the time, and finding out that her lover died without having time to propose to her, she died too, either from a small heart attack or from something. Stephanie married Bernard, and thanks to several fairy large bribes, they adopted Brian and everything seemed to be going well. Becoming the legal parents of a tiny millionaire, they gained access to his money. They were making good money themselves thanks to the business, and everything would have been great if it weren't for that unfortunate Terry, whose Brian must have been given by the devil himself. Bernard quietly entered the room and sat down next to his wife. There was no special love between them from the beginning, but they needed each other. Besides, they were bound by a common dark secret. Stephanie, he said affectionately, calm down, my dear. Nothing terrible has happened. Brian will come. We'll talk to him. Find out how he feels. Maybe he didn't even consider believing that criminal. And even if he did, he can explain everything without going into details. Ultimately, is his opinion really that important to you? Let's say he rejects us. So what? We already have everything we need, and if we want more, we'll get it. Or have you suddenly developed maternal feelings? To hell with feelings, Stephanie waved her hand. It's not about feelings, Bernard. It's about the fact that life has really turned upside down. If rumours start spreading about our past, what difference does it make whether they're proven or not? The rumours will remain, and our reputation will be ruined. We'll be ashamed to show our faces in public. Oh, come on, we've been through worse, and if Brian starts causing trouble, we'll deal with him. What if his business comes to us? In my opinion, that would be good. Can you arrange that? Stephanie asked. When have I ever failed to arrange something, Stephanie? Brian replied. Well, I couldn't prevent this wedding because the subtle matters intervened. Love, so-called. Unfortunately, I'm not very competent in that area, but in business I am, so don't doubt it. I'm not going to coddle Brian, and I'm not going to regret him. But they didn't have to clarify anything, and no one demanded any explanations. Brian and his young wife came to the parents' house a few days later. He immediately announced that he was taking his things. Sorry, so-called parents. But over the past few days, I found out that Terry's father was right. I am an adopted son. I can't say that you were such worthless parents, but you are not my parents. And there are some unpleasant moments in our relationship. 
we'll be living separately with Terry. After all, we're not dependent on each other, and I hope we won't have any claims against each other. I don't want to dig too deep into the past, just because I don't expect to find answers to all the questions that are bound. Okay, I won't resist. You really are an adopted son, Bernard replied calmly. It's perfectly understandable why we kept that a secret, but everything else... Do you really believe the drunken ravings of that criminal, your father-in-law? And are you ready to turn your back on us, your parents? I'm not turning my back on anyone. I just want to live separately. I am a grown man, already married. Stephanie, trying to portray the tragedy, and began to wring her hands, lamented about her ungrateful son, but realising that the performance would not be appreciated, she stopped. You still have to be grateful to us, she said, deciding to have the last word, and it's quite possible that you will regret your words and turn to us for help, and you will be, I hope, ashamed. Bernard chose to avoid any confrontation and simply shrugged at his son's words. When Brian and Terry said goodbye, he went to his wife's room. She paced back and forth, unable to control her anger. Everything is fine, as you can see. Our reputation is intact too. This fool decided not to investigate further and left home like any normal person. No one lives with their parents now. It's normal. Stephanie, stop torturing yourself. I already have a plan on how to teach him that parents, even adoptive ones, should be listened to a little. Yes, Bernard, do what you've planned. I want him to be completely bankrupt, so that he has nothing left, and he crawls on his knees begging for bread. Everything will be as you want, my dear, Bernard said, smiling. After the honeymoon, Brian started working. Things were always going well in his company, so he wasn't worried about anything bad happening without him. And everything was normal at first. But then he hired a new financial director, who seemed reliable and very useful for the business. Little did Brian know that Bernard had placed this person there. The financial director was indeed experienced and knowledgeable, but only in the bankrupting of the companies, and no one was better at it than him. He intrigued skillfully and imperceptibly, and for a long time, no one could understand why things were getting worse every day. Within a few months, the company was on the brink of bankruptcy. Brian realized he probably wouldn't be able to get out of this situation. Serious cash injections were required, and he almost had no money left. But Brian didn't even consider going to his father for help. It was a very difficult period. The young businessman found solace only at home with Terry, who supported him in everything and assured him that they wouldn't fail in any case. Brian, maybe we should really give up on all of this. I can't watch you suffer for this company. But how will we live? We were going to buy a house, and now we can't even pay for an apartment. How will we pay rent next month? If you agree to give up everything, we can move to the village. My grandfather's house is there, quite sturdy and suitable for living. Of course, not like what you're used to, but we'll work and gradually fix everything up. I believe you, Terry, but I'm a city person, and I have no idea what's required in a country house to make it at least suitable for living. The roof will leak there, and I have no idea how to fix it. You'll learn, Brian. It's not that difficult of a science. Besides, we'll take my father with us. He has nothing to do in the city anyway. He can't find a permanent job, but he grew up in the village, and his hands are always in the right place. Paul was thrilled with this idea. He had long dreamed of moving to the village, but never dared to. Eventually, they moved to the village. Brian sold his luxurious car and many unnecessary things. They had enough money to start setting up their new life. Soon, Terry announced that she was pregnant, and Brian's joy knew no bounds. His adoptive parents were also delighted. When they learned that their son was bankrupt, they waited for him to come and ask for mercy. Stephanie rehearsed her angry responses to him in her mind. 
However, Brian never asked for help. And Bernard once said to his wife, Have you heard the news about our son? You'll laugh, Stephanie. They moved to the village. It turns out that our great daughter-in-law has some kind of barn in some remote place. So they moved there. Oh my goodness, he's so proud, exclaimed the spouse. He didn't even come to bow to us. Well, it's his business. He'll live there for a while and then come back to the city. How long will he be able to live in the village? They laughed like children, speculating on the further degradation of the man they had called their son for many years. They felt no sympathy for Brian, let alone for Terry and their potential children. Meanwhile, the young family lived simply, happily, and with hope for the best. Paul was happy to return to his roots, and Terry found everything familiar. Even Brian quickly got used to the new environment. One day, Paul shared an interesting story with his daughter and son-in-law. During my last prison term, he said, I met an old man who was already old and sickly. He had wandered from prison to prison all his life. As a thank you for a favour, he told me about his secret. While he was free, he robbed a jewellery store. He obtained a lot of loot and he didn't have time to use it. They caught him, but he managed to hide the loot in a secret place. The place happens to be not far from us, in an abandoned village. He knew he wouldn't be released and didn't want the loot to go to waste. He had no relatives and he was a loner all his life. And I'm wondering, should I go and check it out? If there's anything there, I'll find it. Terry waved him off, saying, Oh, Dad, you believe in miracles. I agree, the probability is almost zero, but what if? Paul replied. That old man didn't seem like a liar. And why would he lie to me on the verge of death? Well, no one's stopping you from checking it out, said Terry. You'll just waste your time. And so Paul went to that village. He arrived at the right place and indeed found an abandoned hut. But he had to break into the basement, which was not entirely safe in itself. The house was barely standing. With all due caution, Paul opened the door, entered and was surprised to find that the house was inhabited. In the corner, a seven-year-old boy was hiding. What are you doing here? He asked in surprise. I live here. What do you want? The boy replied boldly. I just came to see what kind of Mowgli had settled here. But where are your parents? I don't know and I don't want to know. I don't have any parents. I ran away from an orphanage. And if you want to send me back there, you'd better leave quietly and peacefully. I'll stay here. And how do you live alone? What do you eat? Whatever I can find, the boy replied, suddenly bursting into tears. It was evident that he was hungry. Moreover, he was very young, and his audacity was a defensive reaction. Okay, I have some food with me. You can eat it. Let's go with me. Not to the orphanage, don't be afraid. I'll take you to my place, and you'll live with me. What's your name? Ivan. And your wife won't mind if I come with you? The boy hesitated. I don't have a wife. I have a daughter who's already grown up. She has a husband. Don't worry, it'll be much better with us than here. Okay, if you're not joking, let's go, the boy agreed. After talking to the boy, Paul thoroughly inspected the hut and, of course, did not find any treasure. Maybe they were gone, or maybe someone had stumbled upon it earlier. But nevertheless, the man found a boy who was in great need of adult care. Paul was more than happy to take care of the child, because he had never had the chance to watch his daughter grow up. Well, now he would have a son, or grandson. He announced it upon returning home. Well, folks, come and meet us. This is my treasure, and his name is Ivan. You understand, no one will let me adopt him. I am old, and have even been to prison. So, you will have to adopt him. But don't worry, I'll take care of him by myself. I can take care of myself, Ivan pouted. He really turned out to be a treasure. Independent, serious, and never refuse any work. On the contrary, 
he was eager to help everyone, and whatever he didn't know, he learned with pleasure. Brian and Terry were able to adopt him, although it cost them money as they had to obtain documents for the boy first. It turned out he was already eight, and they had to enroll him in first grade, as he hardly studied in the orphanage. Despite all the difficulties, the house became more and more livable and even comfortable. And then it turned out that Brian's adoptive parents had also gone bankrupt. This happened thanks to the same financial director who helped them bankrupt their son's company. The swindler apparently got the taste and decided he had been too cheap. He completed his employer's task and then began withdrawing money from Bernard's company accounts. Bernard didn't realize it right away, but after he did, he decided not to let the theft go unpunished. He reported it to the police. The fraudster was arrested and he didn't even think of keeping silent and began to tell everything about Bernard's machinations on the very first interrogation. Along the way, other shady deals began to surface. During cross-examinations, two scammers incriminated each other and, as a result, both ended up in court. Brian participated in the process as a witness and victim and, as a result, he was able to recover some of the money. Not all, of course, most of it went offshore, but even what remained was very useful because a daughter was born to the young family during the investigation and trials. Despite the fact that after his wedding, Brian stopped feeling any kinship with his adoptive parents, Stephanie's fate still worried him. She didn't end up in court, but she was left completely alone without money or income. Brian even thought that he should help her somehow. But it turned out that there was no need for that. No matter how much she pretended to cry and faint in court, she wasn't left with nothing. It turned out that she had her own capital separate from her husband's. Sensing that things were getting hot, she managed to hide a lot. And so, when her former son turned to her sympathetically and offered to help, he received a furious response and he left with relief. Not upset, but happy that he would no longer have any relation to this couple. Returning home and telling his real family about how the case was resolved, he just shook his head. Who would have thought that I had lived in such a hornet's nest since birth? And I loved those two. I considered them father and mother. One thing is comforting. I have no genetic connection to them. I hope I don't have any bad inheritance. Oh, this inheritance is all nonsense. Well, look at Ivan's parents, for example. They're not angels, but the boy grows up to everyone's envy. So the main thing is to be and stay a human, Paul expressed his opinion. The whole family, even after receiving decent money, did not move to the city. Nothing held them there anymore.